I'd like to thank everybody for coming. My name is Nick Raines. Uh, I started this looking for an answer for baby Autumn. She has multiple seizures. She's at the maximum uh, medication dose. She can't take any more to cure her seizures. I found out that instead of giving her a non-toxic plant, they stop her heart to bring her out of seizures. And I thought that was absolutely ridiculous. So I started looking into all the different initiatives. And I didn't like any of them. You know, some of them are just absolutely horrible. <laughs> so I, I went looking for a different initiative. Found Mark Pedersen. <laughs> Mark Pedersen wrote the, uh, the Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act for us. And uh, I've been happy ever since. We got it passed through the Secretary of State. And I'd like to introduce you to the creator of our initiative, Mark Pedersen. Come on up, buddy. Thanks, Mark. As, as he said, I'm the author of the, of the Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act. I'm also the co-founder of the uh, CPN Institute, a national not-for-profit cannabis educational organization, and a new organization, the ECS Therapy Center, a national 501c3, focused on cannabis, edu uh, cannabis patient education. I was 56 years a Missourian uh, before moving to Colorado. I'm 58 years old now. I grew up in a small, very polluted little town, Herculaneum, Missouri. That's actually what made me ill. You see, the principal industry there was lead smelting. The uh, car carcinogens were everywhere, outside and inside our homes. You couldn't get away from it, from the plumes billowing out of the massive smokestack to the dust that poured from the dump trucks that rolled up and down my street. Being lead was a normal occurrence long before we realized what it was doing to us. As a certified welder and pipe fitter, I worked in power plants. I also had a small com computer consulting business and a benevolence ministry, a food pantry and related services. We helped people <coughs> with food, with their bills. We also did a lot, I also did quite a bit of hospital visitation. I regularly worked 80 plus hours a week. While remodeling my home there in Herculaneum, I was exposed to heavy levels of lead, cadmium, and arsenic, uh, the byproducts of the lead smelting industry. Uh, roughly 85 years of contamination released and pulled up carpet and opened walls. I became ill, very ill, severe migraine seizures, fibromyalgia pain, neuropathy in my hands and feet. I couldn't do the things that I cared most about anymore. I could no longer provide for my family. My exposure stripped me of my profession, my ministry, my life, and ultimately my family and my health. It was back in 97 when I discovered a small blip on a fibromyalgia news group that stated that cannabis could be effective in the treatment of fibromyalgia pain. I had already been a receptacle of virtually every drug the doctors could throw at me, and I figured, what could it hurt? Nothing else was working. After a few months, of using some very poor quality cannabis from a friend, I discovered that it not only helped me with the pain, and, uh, and remarkably well too, for that matter, it also took away the migraines that even experimental drugs couldn't touch. The seizures, the neuropathy in my hands, my feet, the fibromyalgia, but perhaps the most profound thing that it did for me was by restoring my long-term memory. Uh, precious memories like the birth of my three children. Why did I experience such a profound benefit? As it turns out, all mammals are born with what is called an endocannabinoid system. This is, in simple terms, a lipid messaging system. When we consume plant-based phytocannabinoids, they are similar enough to the endogenous uh, components, the endocannabinoids, to perform as a supplement. They fit the endogenous receptors found throughout the body, much like a skeleton key. What we know of the endocannabinoid system is that it maintains and regulates all of the primary systems of the body, homeostasis being the objective. Recent research suggests that it may well be our primary endocrine system. If this is the case, virtually all of us really need to have access to this plant. When a cancerous tumor develops, very quickly endocannabinoid receptors 
appear about the tumor and engage the cell in what's called apoptosis or cell death. One of the attributes of the endocannabinoid system is its ability to isolate and terminate tumors. The health of the endogenous system really determines whether or not the tumor is allowed to remain. My partner Regina Nelson, her daughter Brianna, came from Michigan to live with us. I live in Colorado Springs. She's 26 years old and the mother of a three-year-old with special needs. Prior to, the move, prior to the move, she was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Michigan surgeons urged, surgeons urged the immediate removal of most of her stomach. Instead, she made the trip to Colorado with her family and began taking cannabis oil that I prepared for her, along with drinking raw cannabis juice, a non-psychoactive superfood that allows phytocannabinoids to boost the immune system very rapidly. Within weeks of arriving at our home, she was rushed to the emergency room where they discovered that her tumor had broken free and was hanging by a small band of tissue. Though we are talking about a Colorado emergency room, they were still quite shocked and didn't have any idea how to proceed. Brianna returned back <coughs> home with us and later she passed the tumor. That's called apoptosis. Uh, she is currently cancer free. I began making cannabis oil primarily uh, so that I could teach other people how, how to do it as well. I knew the miracles that surround cannabis oil. I followed a Missouri man, Brian Shitwood, over three years as he battled terminal melanoma. When we first met, he was recovering from Hodgkin's lymphoma. The chemotherapy that they gave him for the Hodgkin's is what actually gave him the terminal melanoma. Uh, I photographed cannabis oil applied topically to uh, in killing the tumors. I contemplated whether or not I should supply a slide of that, and so if that sort of thing bothers you, you might want to turn away. Barnes Hospital in St. Louis took biopsies of this entire area. This is along his thigh right here. The black lesions, uh, hopefully you can see it from there, the black lesions are, in, are indeed melanoma, but the white lesions are curiously something else. They mutated and are dying. Melanoma is not an easy thing to look at. Watching someone slowly die from it is like watching someone slowly die of leprosy. Brian gave his life so that you could see the miracle that is cannabis oil. Others have died as well, but because of their sacrifice, many more will live because the truth will be fully known. It was Brian who gave me my first ISO-2, the devices that I used to make cannabis oil. It was manufactured in 1978. It's the gold one you see in the back there. Uh, he found his in a garage. It was being used for an ashtray. Remarkably, it still worked. Brian used his to keep himself alive for several years before conventional medicine finally killed him. He told me that he was passing it on to me after his death so that I could in his words, make oil and save lives. So I did. Well, I couldn't make oil from here while I was still living here in Missouri because ISO-2s are illegal here. Uh, Missouri lawmakers saw fit to make this device a, a crime punishable by imprisonment just for owning one. So I gave, so I actually saved Missouri lives in Colorado. I have two of these ISO-2s now. In the past year, we have given away over $75,000 of the oil to the poor and to the needy, made with just these two simple machines here. Little Nova Lee was only two when I first heard about her plight. Her young parents did not have much living in Austin, Texas. They were ill-prepared to have a child with a condition like schizencephaly. Little Nova has only 24% of her brain and a non-functional pituitary gland. Seizures began not long after her birth. Controlling the seizures quickly became impossible in conventional terms. Specialists came up with only two options, a drug called, that caused permanent blindness. Their defense for that is that schizencephaly patients have questionable degrees of blindness due to narrowed optic nerves. So they considered blindness to be acceptable. Their other option involved removing two-thirds of what remained of her brain with absolutely no promise whatsoever that the procedure would impact her seizures at all and knowing full well that very well might kill her. 
The young couple opted to place most of their earthly possessions in a dumpster, loading into their car what was required mostly for the care of their disabled child, and they headed for Colorado. They had no idea how they were going to get medicine for their child or how they were even going to live. I was in touch with them almost from the beginning of their journey. Days later, Barbara, the mother, arrived at our home. Regina, my partner, she, she, took, she prepared a pediatric regimen of cannabis oil, roughly one gram of FECO, full extract cannabis oil, per one ounce of uh, high-grade olive oil. The mom took, back home, took it back home and drew up a dose and placed it in Nova Lee's feeding tube. Almost immediately, Nova Lee seizures stopped completely. They, what emerged in the weeks and the months that, that were to come in all reality was the rebirth of this child. Not only did Noble Lee's seizures continue to diminish, she is now 99% seizure free. In just a few days, her eyes, which once wandered about independently, became fixed on her parents' faces. She began tracking them around the room. She reached out with both hands and grasped her father's beard. Noble began to mimic sounds from her mother and standing up with her father's help. So many things that were thought impossible back when she was in almost constant seizure. Just two months ago, Barbara heard her daughter say mama for the very first time. These are the wondrous side effects of cannabis. And you don't mind me interjecting my quick in my words here, roughly about a week and a half or so ago, that virtually non-existent pituitary gland somehow began to work again. She's producing growth hormone. The doctors considered it impossible. The specialist in Austin told Noble Lee's parents that it was impossible for the cannabis to help her seizures. They're still scratching their heads. But her new neurologist is quite curious because he's seen more, more and more of these cases, these types of positive outcomes, miracles, really. Noble lives because of THC-rich cannabis oil. Gage is a 10-year-old. He's a refugee from Missouri. A month before his mom and dad packed up their family and moved to Colorado, Gage was on life support. He was dying. He had had a grand mal seizure. And it is, it is for many people with this, these conditions, it can be lethal. And it nearly claimed his young life. Seizures completely altered not only Gage's life, but that of his whole family. He couldn't live like a normal child, go to school or play with other kids. Who would have thought that something as simple as a pediatric dose of cannabis oil could make such a difference? Today, only six months later, Gage looks and acts like any 10-year-old boy. Only difference is he receives a very small pediatric dose of cannabis oil, a dose that his school nurse calls incredible and therapeutically dosed due to the, the seizure control and increased performance in school. He's doing quite well. He looks forward to school, and unlike any kid that I've ever known, he actually looks forward to his homework. It was costly, a very costly thing for Gage's mother and father to do to make this move. Uh, not every family can, uh, particularly with a special needs child, uproot themselves and settle in an unfamiliar and distant place, leaving behind their support group, their family and friends, now a healthier young man, Gage's only regret is that his treatment binds him to the boundaries of Colorado and convicts him of being a criminal in Missouri solely on the basis of his life-saving treatment. He misses his cousins and his, grandparents, and his grandparents, but when asked at school what he, he wants to do when he grows up, he gave an interesting answer. He said, I want to make cannabis oil so that other kids can get well like me. Gage thrives on THC-rich cannabis oil as well. Over the last eight years, I have met and interviewed many people. Over 200 of my interviews, my video interviews, can be found on YouTube. City councilmen, mayors, governors, nurses, scientists, but mostly patients. So many illnesses are impacted by cannabis. After all, it supplements a system we already have in our bodies that touches virtually every facet of our being. What a perfect way it is to heal. Science has overwhelmingly proven that cannabis is non-toxic. In fact, science says that cannabis is food. It's been food for the humanity for thousands of years, a superfood 
more nutritious than flax. That's really what gives me the authority to make cannabis oil for the sick and dying. It's food. In fact, there are at least three children right now who would not be with us today if it were not for my oil, cannabis oil, THC, THC rich, full extract cannabis oil, con con excuse me, concentrated food. As Hippocrates said so very long ago, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. You know, I didn't get involved in making cannabis oil because I was looking to supply the unfortunate and the terminally ill with cannabis oil. That's, that's a noble calling I just didn't think of. Now, I started making cannabis oil because I wanted to know how, how to make it so I could teach other people how to do it as well. I was fortunate to learn the simplest and safest way first. As Regina later confirmed when she was presenting at a clinical conference in Italy earlier this year, my method is also the way scientists around the world ensure that they are producing a, 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 the best array of cannabinoids, terpenes, etc. It was during my learning curve that the patients began to come, and oh, how they came. The cancer patients, the seizure patients, the refugees, terrified parents with no options, and children. Though there were many from around, from all over Colorado, refugees poured in from literally all over the country, and they're still coming. We have potluck dinners at our home. Many times we have filled our apartment with refugees from states like Texas, Illinois, Georgia, Nebraska, North Carolina, and most certainly from Missouri. But I know that these are only the lucky ones, the ones who could afford to come. Many thousands remain in non-legal states watching their loved ones struggle just to hold on to life because they don't have the means to move or the way to purchase the costly life-saving oil on the black market. What a terrible thing it is to know that your loved one will continue to suffer and eventually die, not because there isn't a treatment, but because of geography. Hope should not be ruled by zip code. But even in Colorado, as much as 90% of those who need cannabis don't have access. It's cost prohibitive. Colorado still has a thriving black market because of the strict regulations, taxes, and greed. Cannabis is less expensive and more readily available on the black market than in dispensaries. What's more, in dispensaries, they normally don't stock FECO, or full extract cannabis oil like what I make. It's not a hot seller doesn't taste very good when it's smoked. When you do find it, there's always the question of how it was made, uh, the solvents that remain, as well as other contaminants that could, be, could damage a fragile life. And of course, there's the expense. When the proponents of Amendment 64, that's the legalization bill there in, in Colorado, were touting their recreational bill to the public, they fail to address the underlying intentions. We're seeing them now, hidden among the ever-growing mounds of regulation, all geared around pro uh, promoting the recreational use of cannabis and following revenue through the dispensary model, while covertly restricting, with the hope of eventually eliminating home cultivation, caregivers, independent growers, oil makers like me. Who cares if, the cost, the cost, if it costs lives of the poor or the terminally ill? Cannabis reform is about economic growth, tax dollars. If they want to smoke pot, let's make them pay for it, right? As one popular activist once said, Why don't, well, you know, we don't care, let's tax the hell out of it. A few months ago, a good friend of mine, a Parkinson's patient whom I have known and counseled for a number of years, passed away in Kansas City. He had been battling his illness for a number of years. He had tried every conventional and homeopathic treatment he could find. At one point, against my warnings, he spent over $11,000 for questionable cannabis oil off the internet. He was desperate. I could have provided his oil at a fraction of that cost. But he did receive some significant benefit from the oil. The unfortunate thing is that he didn't follow with a maintenance dose. Uh, it was to cost pro it was cost prohibitive for him, and honestly, he was just afraid. He was 70 plus years old. I wrote the Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act about a year ago. 
I did so to fulfill a promise I had made to the citizens of Missouri that I would write the bill that they really wanted, not another compromise, but what the people actually wanted, real legalization. I knew what the people of Missouri wanted because I asked them in the many meetings that I've held all over the state. The farmers told me that they desperately needed help. Industrial hemp could once again be a major cash crop for Missouri, not in these wait-and-see research programs that we're seeing popping up all over the country, but a real hemp industry, like the one we once had, but with 21st century technology. The big agricultural equipment companies, like John Deere, are already ready for us. We know because we, they proudly told us when we asked them. Did you know that cannabis paper, just paper alone, is a $200 billion a year industry in China? Just paper. With a wide array of products that can be made from hemp, it's not hard to realize that in a legal and free market, cannabis represents a trillion dollar industry to the Midwest, putting many to work and helping so many others. As long as cannabis remains on the controlled substance list, by state or federal mandate, it can never fully be legal. That's why the very, the very first line of the Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act removes cannabis entirely from the Missouri's list of controlled substances. No non-toxic substance belongs on that list. Removing cannabis from the controlled substance list means it can be properly classified as a food. Over 6,000 years of basically being nutrition and medicine for the human race, it should be again. This is how we end prohibition and spark a new beginning with truth. No longer hanging on to falsehoods, hypocrisies, and government propaganda. If we hope to undo this terrible social wrong, then we must in fact undo it, not continue to prohibit it in thinly veiled public policies. Every policy, public policy that has been drafted or endorsed by any of the leading cannabis advocacy organizations has not only failed to reverse prohibition, but in fact endorse it. Sin-based public policy. It's easier to tax the hell out of it if you think consuming it is somehow harmful or sinful. But consuming cannabis is not a sin, not if you examine the evidence, and not worthy of an excise tax either, a sin tax. It is, it is for that reason that my scholarly partner, Regina, convincingly endorses policies that are based in evidence. Evidence like the real people I'm discussing here today. Evidence-based public policy. Why would any national cannabis advocacy organization endorse the use of DUI against those that they brag to represent? Cannabis is a food. Your liver sees it as such and passes it through to be stored in your fat cells. That's why a cannabis user can test positive for days, even weeks after using, long after the euphoria has subsided. Alcohol and prescription drugs are held in the liver as it struggles to convert them to a non-toxic substance and expel them as quickly as possible. It's for that reason that heroin and cocaine addicts have little fear of the drug test. And yet, like 20% of the other Coloradoans, I cannot pass a cannabis test. I am a walking, talking DUI. Even though I rarely experience euphoria, I'm a patient. To date, no scientific evidence can link blood and urine tests to impairment. Those who don't want you to read my bill will say it lets people, anybody drive stone. Actually, what it says is, and I quote, the use and or possession of cannabis should not, shall not be grounds for issuing a driving under the influence or DUI charge, arrests, or fines when operating a motor vehicle. That's all it says. Basically, you have to be committing a real crime. You can't be ticketed or arrested because you use cannabis or because you look like somebody who does or because your car might fetch a good price if claimed an asset forfeiture. Profiling is bigotry. It's not police work. It's encouraging. I've received uh, thank yous and well wishes from literally all over the world since drafting this bill. But I have received criticism, criticism, curiously all from right here in Springfield, Missouri. Statements saying things like that 
an eight-year-old child can walk into a store and buy a bag of weed under my bill. That actually got me thinking. So I headed down to the local dollar store and took a look around. What I found was not unlike any department store, grocery store, or convenience mart that I had been in anywhere in the country. As you can see by this photo, this picture was taken at an eight-year-old's height. There, at a child's height, were cold medicines, birth control, pain remedies, and at the end of the aisle, bleach. Around the corner, I found mouse and rat poison, all within the easy reach of an eight-year-old child, and actually younger. After a careful review, review of virtually every food item that I could find in the store, I surmised that cannabis would probably be the healthiest thing an eight-year-old child could take out of that store. So really what this discussion has to do with really isn't toxicity, but euphoria. Science has proven overwhelmingly that cannabis does not cause brain damage, but actually instills neural protection, and that unlike pharmaceuticals and alcohol, it actually is good for the body and the brain. So the powers that be in the National Cannabis Advocacy Organization that has criticized my bill, in reality, their problem is with euphoria. My answer to that, actually, is found in the very question of why, with so many toxins within easy reach, why are not more of our children poisoned? I know a very, I know a very few cleanser and medicine cabinets across the country that bear a padlock. Two simple phrases. Parental guidance, that's if you're a child, and personal accountability, excuse me, if you're grown. Or what the Bible states, and I'll paraphrase, train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, particularly in regard to euphoria, if you have personal and or religious feelings against the experience of euphoria and feel strongly against your child experiencing it, it's your job as a parent to instruct them so. It's not the job of law enforcement or the court system to enforce personal beliefs. Little Isaiah wasn't quite three years old when his young refugee parents brought him to our home. They were Nebraska natives. Isaiah was suffering from multiple kinds of seizures for most of his life. An adult dose of Lamectol did not remedy his convulsions. Lamectol is a drug prescribed for bipolar disorder. It's off-label for 2 to 16 year olds with irretractable seizures. Isaiah began an adult dose of this drug when he was 7 months old. No other anti-epileptic drug helped either. The parents knew they had to do something anything to stop their child's seizures. Cannabis was very obviously their own, only hope. Entering our home, it was the, everything the young father could do just to hold on to his flailing son. As he carried him into our living room and he sat down on our couch, we sat there and talked for a little bit as we assured the young couple that cannabis posed no harm to their young child. The mom asked if she could administer a small pediatric dose sublingually. With poor Isaiah flopping his head from side to side, it was difficult, but the mom pressed in with a needleless syringe and deposited the suspension between his teeth and his lip. Three minutes passed as I observed little Isaiah, his eyes rolling about and his arms and head flailing, a near constant experience at this point. But suddenly he stopped. Isaiah seemed to wake up. Intently, he scanned the room. When his father spoke, Isaiah slowly and matter-of-factly turned on his father's lap and gazed into his eyes. Surprised, his father start, stated, he's never acknowledged me like that before. It had been over two years since he had looked into his, either of his parents' eyes because of the constant seizures he was experiencing and the terrible drugs that, that he was prescribed. In the months that followed, Isaiah has continued to grow, exploring a life that is virtually seizure-free, and as important, free of the toxic pharmaceuticals that cause so much harm to his tiny body. He now follows his mom from room to room in his house, shouting, Mommy, what better evidence do we have that cannabis is good medicine? Isaiah takes a THC-rich cannabis oil, along with an oil rich in CBD, to mitigate the withdrawal from the pharmaceutical drugs. <coughs> 
truly healing shouldn't know any boundaries. The rest of our nation's children suffered the same illnesses and afflictions as Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas children do. I know that God made oil for children from all these areas for refugees. How can we deny these are most vulnerable and knowing it's safe for even those whose lives hang by a thread? Why do we jail our adults for just appreciating their benefits? The truth is out there. I live with it daily. The miracles, they accompany us perpetually. As for America's chronically and terminally ill, they shouldn't have to leave their home, their state, to appreciate these things, to save the life of a loved one. All families should have the assurance of a safe, holistic choice, apart from the harmful, dangerous pharmaceuticals. It's time to put away the hypocrisy and accept the truth we know about cannabis. It's food, and America deserves the healing that it can bring. Supporting the Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act begins to undo the social wrongdoing that began back in the 30s and continues to today. It avoids the entanglements of prohibitionist profiteers, cartels, and black market. Instead, it treats cannabis as the public health issue that it truly is. The Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act is evidence-based public policy. Thank you. Y'all have questions? Anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, how are you going to deal with uh, the feds uh, if the Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act happens as far as uh, cannabis being a class one drug still and consider you know, same category as heroin and what have you? It's a schedule one drug. Yes, sir. And uh, actually, some states have changed the scheduling. We have states like uh, Oregon has moved into a Schedule Three. Was supposedly supposed to move to a Schedule uh, Schedule Two. Is supposed to move to a Schedule Three. Iowa uh, moved it to a Schedule Two and doesn't even have a medical cannabis program. States have the capacity to, uh, to achieve that. I currently live in Colorado. Colorado looks at the national. So even though Colorado supposedly is the most legal of anywhere in the nation, it's still a Schedule One drug there. It's that disparity. There's a reason why there are bars on the windows of the dispensaries and why there are bars on the doors and big, meaty guards who stand at the doors. It's because it's a Schedule One drug. If they were to open up a heroin shop down from your house, you would expect that there would be those kinds of security, which is really shows the real disparity of what we're talking about here. We're talking about a non-toxic substance. So that's why the very first line of our bill removes cannabis entirely from the list of controlled substances. Every state in the union can do that. States just choose not to. Uh, whenever the last bill was being drafted in the state of Colorado, I was in communication with them at the time, and I strongly recommended that they move it to a schedule, to move it completely off the drug schedule. They told me flatly to my face they refused to do so. The reason is because the dispensaries didn't just happen. They came about by design. Their purpose is to channel a great deal of money down through a very small funnel and make a very small group of people very wealthy. Unfortunately, they avoid the science and the medical side of cannabis, the real appreciation that our nation can feel. They avoid that for the sake of money. Uh, I've already testified twice in the state since I've been living in Colorado already because of policy that was drafted by people within the industry within the cannabis industry. We're seeing this already happening, playing out in California and Oregon and Washington, uh, most definitely in, in, in Colorado and in, in virtually every state across the country that is passing some form of medical cannabis legislation, there are these same kinds of restrictions because now cannabis is becoming mainstream and, and mainstream in the fact of the industry. We're having the industry is becoming so wealthy now that they can control policy. So you, in effect, I am trying to educate the general public, those who are ignorant about cannabis therapy, at the same time fighting those who should be on my same side, you know. But the fact of the matter is cannabis should belong to all of us. You know, it shouldn't be ransomed out to a few, just those people who can afford it. Like I said, I've given away over $75,000 worth of oil in the past year to the needy, to people who never would step foot in a dispensary because they can't afford to. They can't afford to. There were at least three of the children we currently provide cannabis for would not have made it past Christmas. 
you know, this, this is what we're really talking about. What I'm really hoping to express to all y'all is the humanity that is, the, that is what we're really talking about with campus. Okay? Not the stuff you're being told, not the, not the propaganda side. There's a, so much more to, to cannabis than just getting high. And for y'all's information, this is me high. Okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I had to say that. Yes, sir? In the state of Missouri, didn't they uh, uh, make it legal for the oil last year? What C did CBD bill. Thank you. Yes, it's a CBD bill. CBD is only one cannabinoid found in the cannabis plant. Or they've already isolated over 90 that have medicinal benefit. There's literally hundreds of substances found within the cannabis plant. So there's many more that could have medicinal benefit. CBD is one, only one of those. I make both THC oil and CBD rich oil. What we found is, see, uh, THC more perfectly replicates an endogenous substance. THC very closely replicates anatomite. CBD repli more closely replicates another one called uh, 2-AG. Uh, THC actually fits the endogenous receptors, where CBD does not. It kind of modulates from, from out and about. And that's really kind of important because it's to understand that the cannabinoids actually work synergistically together. Uh, scientists, when the scientists, this interesting information that Regina brought back from Italy this past year is the fact that the individual cannabinoids, when you separate them, they lose their effectiveness dramatically. It falls away. They work synergistically together. So what, what we quite often will experience with, with people, particularly if they're having issues with the euphoria as well, is we look at a more even ratio of THC to CBD. THC is the, is the cannabinoid that actually gets you high. CBD, they, you'll hear it stated that it, it's the part of marijuana that doesn't get you high. Actually, it does cause some form of euphoria, some, some euphoria, but it has a, it, it's, it's effective in a different way by working with cannabis, uh, by working with THC. We found that, um, talking about seizure disorders, there's only one that really responds well to CBD, and that's uh, Dravet syndrome. But there are many other forms of seizures, and the children that I've mentioned here today, they actually experience many different kinds of seizures all at the same time or different times throughout the day. So CBD is effective medicine, and it's very good medicine. Unfortunately, it, a bill of goods has been sold to the state of Missouri and the rest of the nation in regard to CBD, and it's a misunderstanding about how it functions as medicine. It, it is medicine, and it's actually we use it considerably for getting children off of prescription drugs, out the withdrawal. So uh, they, they still require THC. And a, as a matter of fact, a number of the children who are currently receiving uh, cannabis oil, high CBD cannabis oil, from the realm of caring, who you may have heard about from the Sanjay Gupta special on CNN. I don't know if you all have heard that about that or not. But that's how the whole CBD craze began, was because of the special on CNN. And, uh, but a number of the children from that original dispensary uh, come to us for THC-rich cannabis oil to supplement the CBD that they receive. So yes, CBD is good medicine. Unfortunately, by itself, it does not work. Uh, by its, it only works for a very small group of people, Dravet syndrome. Um, the other children with other illnesses they were experiencing, 25%, possibly, maybe 30% eradication of their seizures as opposed to what we're seeing anywhere from 65 to 95 percent, 99 percent seizure free. Hey Doug. Mark, how are you? Good. Good. Other questions? Yes sir. I understand that the there was trouble with the dispensaries being able to deposit their money into the banks in Colorado and they were ending up with large amounts of cash and yes. that was probably part of the bars on the windows, part of that. Um, is it true that that's been eased up in Colorado now? The federal government has eased up? They're working on it. That's about all I can really say on it. I've, I've seen dispensaries with most astronomical deposits. You know, I, they showed them to me. You know, we, we, we're rather well known in Colorado among a lot of different dispensaries throughout. We, we provide education. We don't actually sell cannabis. We provide education and such. So I've toured many dispensaries throughout Colorado. And uh, yeah, it's, it is an unnerving experience to handle many, many tens of thousands of dollars every day because 
banks that are federally insured will, will not receive your money. But the banks want it. They want it. They want it bad. I mean, because there is a tremendous amount of income that is coming in through the state. But unfortunately, because they're not federally insured, the bigger banks will steer away from it. There's a number of different things that they're doing to try to get around that, and things that they're doing, working with some private accounts and different things, which it's a mess. It just really is a mess. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the cannabis the juice. Are you juicing the whole plant or just the buds or the stalk? And is it a mature plant, a young plant? What, what we see is the optimum is roughly about five weeks. At roughly about five weeks. The plant's still very much immature. The buds haven't, they haven't really formed. They're just very small. But what we're actually going for are the precursors to the cannabinoids I'm talking about. The precursors that we're finding tremendous benefit, particularly in hormonal issues, uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, testicular cancers, a lot of other different other illnesses like that. We're seeing a real benefit by drinking raw cannabis juice. This is juice in its whole plant whenever possible. If you have a, a food processor that can handle it's very tough. You need really tough blades to be able to do this. And they're demulsifiers, I believe is what they call them as well, because they strip a lot of the plant matter out of it as it's juicing and straining. Uh, they juice the leaves, the, the smaller stems, and as much of the stalk as the machine can take and handle. If at all possible, the roots as well. Uh, but it takes such a tremendous amount to get a very tiny amount. And if you can imagine juicing every, you know, you have to grow your plants five weeks, and then many cases we're talking about one plant only covering one, maybe two days, okay? So you have got to have a lot of plants in the ground to be able to provide cannabis, uh, cannabis juice every day, you know, seven days a week, and that's really what you need. We're, our, we're in Colorado where it's the freest, right? And yet, finding <coughs> anyone who juices is next to impossible. I have a close personal friend of mine who actually runs a not-for-profit where they do produce juice, they get plants donated to them, they juice and they give them, give them out to people, give, pass it out to people, but it's hard. Uh, I have a plan, a way in which I believe that we're going to be able to achieve it, we're going to be able to get the majority of our people be able to have access to raw juice, but it's going to take some doing to be able to do it. Uh, it uh, and then, then we have other issues as well that, that enter into that as well. Yes, does it grow in an aquaponic type setting or does it have to be soil or does it matter? It grows in either hydroponic or, or, or soil. We find an ever increasing number of the people who grow commercially grow in soil as opposed to hydroponic. Hydroponic, <laughs> though I, I do have dispensaries I, I know of who do hydroponic, the vast majority of seem to do, do dirt. And, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't necessarily matter either way for, for that. Of course, again, the, the biggest problem is is that if you're looking at hydroponic, how many plants you have got to be growing hydroponically to be able to sustain it. Now, under under most of the bills, like for currently for the state of Missouri, six plants, you see that would be absolutely impossible to be able to sustain. And the other thing, conditions like Crohn's. We, uh, we have a 10-year-old from Illinois who he was going to have surgery, he was going to have a, a, a bowel resection for Crohn's. The last uh, test that they performed on him, they could not find any Crohn's. The Crohn's was completely gone. You know, there's things like that, which are seemingly medical impossibilities. These are the kinds of things we're seeing. And fast, the, one of the main reasons why we're seeing this is because we're starting to delve into higher amounts of cannabis, which seems like the opposite thing we, we do. But, through the years, we've always titrated by the high, by the euphoria. Once we realized euphoria was just a side effect, that there was far more we could accomplish with this medicine, particularly with higher doses. And we could accomplish those higher doses because the human body adjusts very rapidly. <coughs> just as I was saying before, this is me high. I've been using cannabis for over 18 years. I don't experience euphoria anymore. There are times in my life I've had some very stressful times, and I've had some times battling illness. I still get sick from time to time. There have been some times I would have really appreciated having it for you. It would have been a nice release. But I gladly trade it for the ability to be able to stand here before you all today. Uh, Eighteen years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to hold a conversation with you. Questions? I don't know if I answered. I'm sorry. Did I, did I, did I answer that okay? Yes, sir. I, this last week I have already attended four meetings concerning HB 800, the medical 
marijuana bill in Missouri. And uh, I'm a little torn about it because on the one hand it is restrictive as far as what it covers and it seems like a money maker for those who have the money to get into the industry. For instance, uh, you have to uh, pay a $12,500 application fee, which is non-refundable if you are rejected. And it seems like uh, certain parties and certain uh, entities are just waiting for Missouri you know, to pass the medical so they can go in and basically become richer than what they are now. I can assure you 100% that's exactly now, true. Now, my question is, as a Missourian, are we supposed to take whatever we can get as far as something is better than nothing? Let, let me get that one. Okay. <laughs> I got Babies, I understand babies that. are dying. I understand that. Humans are dying. Why are we putting prohibition on a non toxic plant, period. It's absolutely insane that we have to let little babies die. Right. But my question is, as a Missourian, is something better than nothing? No. no. Is something no. better than what? No, and i tell you why. One of the main reasons is, my bill, like all those other bills, they, they're of the, the initiatives in particular. The House bills, of course, is a little bit different, but they, they are all editing the Constitution of the state of Missouri. You're setting something in stone, okay? And do you want to set something in perfect in stone? Because it's going to take another general election to take and change it back. It's going to take all the hard work that we're currently doing, gathering signatures and doing all the work we're doing, all the money that's being spent. Not a whole lot of money for me. It's been mostly, and this gentleman, mostly sweat equity because we're a little poor. But it's, it's going to be a whole lot of sweat equity all across the country, this state. For our campaign alone, we have a goal of 2,000 volunteers across the state. I actually wrote the Show Me Cannabis Legalization Initiative in 2012, which collected a number of signatures across the state as well. I was the original writer of that bill. I'm no longer connected in any way with that group. But uh, they had over 1,500 volunteers on the ground then for that one as well. So, Baby steps really aren't possible in the state of Missouri. I've talked pretty long and hard about baby steps. And the reason is because of the amount of effort it actually takes to change law. It needs to be that kind of effort. I want that kind of effort. I had the option, I could have wrote a referendum and just repealed everything, except for the fact that the coming year, our lawmakers would change it all back. I have no faith in Missouri lawmakers. I'm sorry. I have met with two lasted many of them, and I found every last one of them to be crooked. I've had, I've introduced people who were terminally ill to them and had them stare me right in the face, spitting on me, as they told me that they would never vote for, a, for any kind of bill regarding cannabis because it was a career killer. Not because of the children, <laughs> the, that it, you know, anything regarding our health, not regarding your health or the health or safety of your children, but only because it protects their job not to. So, you know, it's just like these people are supposed to take care of us, they're supposed to, supposed to protect us, but they don't. They, they basically coddle the, a big business, you know, and they would sooner pass legislation for, that would protect organizations like the one that made me sick, don't run lead smelting company, because of the wealth that they might receive from it, rather than being concerned about the people they're killing. Yeah. Well, I find it interesting that legislators I talked to a year ago who were dead against any kind of marijuana bill. All, I mean, I'm just, can I be honest here? Sure, go Okay, ahead. Montel Williams rolls into Jeff City. Yes. Okay, all of a sudden, the legislators who were against it six, eight months ago, all of a sudden they're on the bandwagon, okay, for medical marijuana. And, you know, I just see it. Montel has a number of dispensaries in California. I've been on his program a couple of times, his radio program a couple of times. I'm sorry, I'm not overly impressed with him. He suffers from MS. The man has neuropathy in his hands and feet. He has to smoke cannabis just to climb out of bed, just to be able to put his feet to the floor. You know, um, I don't understand the man. Even in the midst of all this, he's looking to take and make a profit. You know, even at the point of restricting access to other people. 
I have a real issue with that. I listened to his spiel of stuff whenever he came to, to uh, Missouri. I think he was on a network out of St. Louis or something. I saw it on the internet. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's another profiteer, plain and honest, plain and simple. You know. and, and how can people afford it, okay, if, with our if, if they go with these bills and so forth, like HB 800 or what have you? I mean, uh, the median income of, say, Christian County is around $25,000 a year. Lawrence County is even lower, lower than that. How are people going to afford the, the medical marijuana under these legislative it's, bills? It's not sustainable. I mean, you take an average income, okay? Who do you know of can afford $500 a month to pay out for medicine? How about 1000 How about $1,500? $2,000 every month. Can you afford that? Mm -hmm. That's why it's that's why there can't be any regulation on how it's plant in my eyes anyway. That's, can you grow it for your kids if you need it? Or do you need a permit? Well, personally, if my kids need it, I'll grow it. Legally speaking, no matter what. You Thank you, you, sir. Go go say you say your kids away from doing it. And the whole thing is that's you're gonna problem. go to jail if you yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're going to the population jail. is so full of prisons right now just from the same thing. Just from people trying to help themselves medically, mm -hmm. yes, a lot of them are doing it just because they're rebels or other reasons in my eyes. But it, the main thing is that they need a lot of people need this, and their body knows it, and they're going to seek it. When someone and we're putting them in jail for that. When someone tells you prohibition is good, remember the babies that are dying. Remember the people that have died in the past. Our grandparents, you know, their grandparents were all lied to about the medical quality of cannabis. With our initiative, you won't be ch charged an excise tax. You will be charged whatever your local and state taxes are. Your sales tax. Your, your regular tax. sales tax. And That's also, what you're going to be charged with minus. If you're our a medical tax. patient, you you don't pay tax on, on this. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is, that, is that if you're sick, particularly if you're chronically or terminally ill, you're under no doctor's care, you have enough to deal with without having to pay taxes on that as well. You're, you're being punished enough. Don't the way settle. I look at it. Vince, don't settle. Oh, I'm not saying that, but I'm just concerned how the people are going to afford it, even perhaps with the well, Cannabis Restoration Protection Act. It, I mean, it will be the lowest in the country. It will keep cartels out because they can't go lower than, you know, lower than state and local taxes. Well, that's one of the things. Once cannabis is the same as any other food, that's when you'll see the price of cannabis dropping even more, even greater. I've talked with some different growers, and growers who are talking to me, telling me things like saying, well, we can't sell cannabis lower than a $1,000 a pound like that. And I just smile at them. Because once cannabis, you don't have restrictions on it. You don't have to jump through hoops to be able to grow it. You don't have, you know, once uh, it's being mass produced, much more so. And communities are basically controlling the quality because if you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. There are places in this this country, uh, states, where you don't even get to see what the product you're buying. So you don't even know how good the quality is. It's, it's in a closed up opaque container. You just have to take what they give you. You go to Nevada or Arizona, you're going to be lucky if you can go into a dispensary and get anything at all. They, Monday, Tuesday, they're sold out. So. You're just out of luck, or you have to go to the black market. But if you go to the black market, you're going to get a much better quality cannabis. Again, what's the sense of that? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Scott. I don't know if you guys heard or not, but Springfield's now got, been declared to have the highest poverty of any city in Missouri. And wow. there's probably a lot of reasons for that. But my question is, I didn't see the part about uh, expunging laws on marijuana as part of this. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Our initiative expresses any. And, non -violent and it just so happens that Greene County Jail here is no longer accepting any prisoners from Springfield because I heard that too. they're full up. You know, it's kind of interesting in that when they put a price on our bill from the uh, the uh, Secretary of State, from the auditor, from the auditor, when she, they put a price on our bill, part of the bill was actually lost revenue from the prison system. I said nine hundred thousand dollars on my bill, and it's like I'm looking at the bill, going, wait a minute, nine hundred thousand dollars. You're not starting any new departments to do my bill. You know, I mean, that's what it is. When you see a, any kind of medical program, there are 
thousands and thousands of dollars because they have to hire employees to take and man these different things, to cover these agencies, to make sure the permits and everything are going like they should and all that. It becomes very expensive. Well, you, know, you had a, I'm sorry, you had a question. Yes, sir. Just going back to how you're going to afford it, I mean, this bill allows you to grow your own. You don't have to go buy it from somebody else. You know where it's coming from. You know what it's dirt coming from your backyard. Thank you. That's so a good point. You're a juicer and you're getting the full plants benefits. You can eat the leafy greens on a salad. You can eat. The, you can have male plants that are producing seeds. You can have every aspect of the plant. Yes, sir. You don't have to go you, to you a got dispensary it. that has a monopoly. <laughs> you understand our initiative. So that's to Ex excellent point. Excellent point. Yes, sir. It comes down to personal choice for me. It's yes, it's illegal here. But when your health becomes a life and death situation, what overrides what? For me, it's my health and my family's health over any law. Does law determine morality? Absolutely not. Well, you know, right. we, you we, we talk votes, about we talk about. That's why the, we don't have a pure democracy because 51 percent could vote to exterminate the 49 percent. Is that moral? People out here that say <laughs> you, you should, you're, you're breaking the law, you should go to jail. They're saying that the 51% should be able to exterminate the 49%. Babies That's what they're saying. Are dying. We don't have a democracy in Anybody America. We have a republic with democratic principles. That's going back to your question earlier about federal law and state law. Federal law has no bearing on state law. We're 50 states that are their own sovereign countries that came together to create a super country. The federal law only applies to federal entities, federal territories like Puerto Rico, Guam, and federal agencies and federal agents. State law determines state law. We don't have to say, oh, well, this is violating the federal law. And feds have absolutely no policing authority in a state except through the sheriff. We need to elect sheriffs that realize their their authority as a constitutional sheriff. The sheriff is the highest. Why are we not electing our judges in Green County? <clears throat> Jules, did you have a point? It just requires us to educate our citizenry Maybe about these things, about, about the true po potential, that, or the, well, the true power of the citizenry. They keep us dumbed down because if you don't know your rights, you lose them. You don't know what they are, so you can't stand on them. Well, the, the one thing we have to understand, we have to do, is, is that, is that the, the governments take authority because we allow them to. Allow them. You don't go ask the king to recognize your rights. You just. <laughs> Well, take them. We are, it, this this bill mentions the ninth and tenth amendment, and, and the reason, part of the reason why we mention the ninth and tenth amendment is to point out the fact that you don't have to have laws to state the truth. The fact that you have liberty, that you have, you have inalienable rights as an American. Right. That you don't have to have every law, every right that you have pointed out to our government. Right. You don't have to have them written down. Right. We have those anyway. What we talk about in the in, in our amendments is, hey, these these things definitely so, but everything else too, you know. You should have the right to put into your body anything you so choose to put in your body because it belongs to you, and you're the one who pays the price if you put poison in your body, right? Exactly. So you should have the right to put whatever substance you so choose in your body. Most certainly, if it's something that is going to save your life, should you have the right to be able to put that in your body? You know, or, or save your child. I'm sorry, step in front of you. Or yeah. save your child's life. Or what, save your child's what, life. What, what if your child is the sick one, and the government says you can't use, you have, like this baby, you have to stop her heart to bring her out of her seizure. You can't use a non-toxic plant. That's what they're telling them. And we're just supposed to say okay. And that that is not okay. <laughs> I we stopped. need people to stand up, not not put regulations so parents can't get their children the medicine. I've stopped pediatric seizures in as little as three minutes. Adult seizures in roughly eight to ten. I beat out the paramedics. You know. He's seen this with his own eyes. He's done it. The difference. With his own hands. The difference for a child like like little Autumn up here that she's a Kansas resident. She doesn't have access to cannabis oil, but I already know for a fact I can stop her seizures. Well, see what a seizure represents to a child like that is needles, IVs, 
uh, bright lights, very toxic poisons in inner veins. It means that, that like they said, they're going to have to stop her heart, chances are. But she's going to experience at least three to five days in the hospital minimum and a lot of terrible experiences. Little Shane, who lives with us, he spent a year and a half, his, his first year and a half of his life in a hospital. He's terrified to see somebody in scrubs. He screams. Now, the medicine that I give him, he calls that his green medicine. Green medicine. <laughs> but he came out of the hospital this last go around where they, while he was in the hospital, he was in there because he, he had some, some fluid on a lung and they put him in there for a precaution. In the middle of the night, they ripped out his feeding tube by accident it's in his belly and he had to undergo emergency surgery. All of this nonsense that never would have had to happen, you know. And for a child like Autumn who missed a seizure, that's what they have to go through every time. And the mom than anyone else in the family. Yeah. That's what they go through, along with the expense. Baby Autumn has four brothers and sisters. Chris Bay is raising five children. And this is the one that gets her attention. It's not fair. It's not fair to the other children that... The, the seizure medications, quite often with children like, 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 uh, like Baby Autumn, makes them virtually autistic. It strips them of their emotion. You know, when they, they walk around and they look right through you, if, if they can walk around. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, and that's kind of the case with Baby Autumn. They, they can't see her personality because of all the drugs that she has to endure. <coughs> drugs that don't take away her seizures. And so I can take them away. I know that for a fact. So. Questions? Anybody? Yeah. Cool. Yes, ma'am? Hey, I'm completely ignorant about this stuff. Sure. Is cannabis like corn? X amount of varieties, and you grow a particular variety for a particular. Some people think there are, there are many, many different strains to cannabis. And then whenever you're looking at medical cannabis, and then you could look at industrial hemp, which is the same thing. It's all one plant. But then you've got all these other strains in industrial hemp as well. You've got a smorgasbord of plants that you can choose from with a wide array of different cannabinoids, the active components found within the plant. What we do and we look at is we look at the cannabinoids, the actual components of the plant, even more so than we do the actual strains. And, and, and the, the ratios of the two primary ingredients, the THC and the CBD, we look at the combination of those. And, and by, you can, people get all tied up in the euphoria side of this. But in an in a, in a equal balance of THC and CBD, there's very little euphoria actually experienced. But then we also mitigate euphoria with other things like choline supplements, uh, which we, we do tell uh, try to promote with our uh, cancer patients too, because it helps to mitigate the high as well. In other words, gives the patient time to their, for their body to adjust to the cannabis so that they don't ex have any kind of bad experience from taking it. The human body adjusts very rapidly to a very large amounts of cannabis. And I say that because most adults, and I say most adults because children don't have a problem with it. Like I said, we have children that we've started younger than the age of one who are on a THC-rich cannabis oil. Our children aren't getting high. We've been accused of that. They say, oh, you're getting those yeah, kids high. high. No, they were high when they were taking adult doses of morphine and oxycotton and all these other highly toxic drugs. You see like little baby Shane who lives with us. He comes in, he takes his medicine, runs cheerfully on into the room. Just about four months ago, all he could do was lay on the couch and cry. He hardly even spoke. Now he's very articulate in speech. He runs about. This little boy, he had open heart surgery. He's had surgery on his legs for displaced his hips were dysplasia, hip dysplasia, and, and all these different things. As a little guy, he had that tube in his side. He hasn't had to take any food through his feeding tube now for almost five months now. But he couldn't take any food at all by mouth before. This is this again. These are the things that we're experiencing. When you're saying that's not to different strains and stuff, my experience with it, so screen X, Absolutely. And it, it, again, it kind of depends upon your illness. It has a lot to do with it as far as what strains or, or what, what kinds that you choose from. And so what we look at is, again, we look at the cannabinoid content, 
of the different strains, how, what, how much THC is in this particular strain, how much CBD, those sorts of things, and we make determinations on that whenever we're picking a strain for a patient. But uh, again, I make cannabis oil, so basically what I have is a product that is already in oil. It's not, you know, you're not actually seeing the flower or the, the leaves or anything like that. You're seeing the liquid. When, when I'm talking about a dose, excuse me, what I'm talking about when I talk about a dose, cannabis oil, li quite literally, we're talking about in a maintenance dose, or for somebody who's not a cancerous issue, we're t literally talking about dipping a toothpick in, into the oil, not even beating up the oil on a toothpick. That is a dose of, concent of, of concentrated oil. Well. If this initiative goes through, we can find out what works with what the best. It opens all that up. No regulation. Let's find out just how far we can take cannabis in regenerating our health. And that's what the Missouri Cannabis Restoration and Protection Act does. It opens it up to find out what we're doing. Right now we have an explosion. No when state comes, has this. When it comes this to is a gold mine. finding out things, new illnesses, which cannabis can affect, can benefit. It's literally an explosion going on right now as far as research and things. It's really interesting. Like I mentioned before, Regina Nelson, my partner, she's been in Italy, uh, was over there presenting in Italy at the, Net, at the International Cannabinoid Research Symposium. She came back with all this information that it wasn't about new medicines they were creating. It was about justifying and recognizing the treatments we've already been doing right here. People like myself, caregivers, are already doing with patients. It's verifying and, and endorsing that, which is pretty cool. But, but she's over there, she's over there, and she's presenting. They, you have to stand, they're testing on mice and rats and baby piglets. We work with children. So they gathered around her because they wanted to know because we're working with real people. You know, and but uh, it's it's there. You know, and it, <coughs> arthritis, uh, uh, name an illness for me, any illness out there. It's not just cancer and seizures. Like I said, I have been a patient for over 18 years. Cannabis is my Tylenol. It's my Tums. My stomach is ripped apart with pharmaceutical medications. I can eat anything now. I love Lexington. I was looking on that brochure when you listed uh, all different kinds of illnesses. I didn't see Parkinson's on there. Well, it's, we just, it, it we just, just didn't put it on the Okay. Block. That was right. one that, that there's kind of so many, effect. we just picked and choose. If I may go further with her use question, Chair, she had mentioned about the corn aspect of mm -hmm. things. I'd like to go a little bit further. The, the strands are derived from the same plant. Yes, some are more active than others for certain things, medication, let's say. Other plants are more active for industrial purposes. They don't have the quantity of THC or other components that allow people to get their high off of. The CD, CD, but you CBD. CBD count is in there, but the THC isn't. So the usability for medicinal aspect is reduced, but health is still good. Or food, things like that. So yes, there's a lot of differences. So a farmer can plant whatever strain he wants if this goes through. Has anybody ever had any foundation problems in their lives? <laughs> uh, they have right now what's called hempcrete, which is 10 times stronger than steel. You, your foundations of your house are going to last 10 times longer than steel. The, the industrial uses of cannabis is a whole other area. Cars so so they yeah, and, and, make full cars out of the time. It's it's just little pieces like this that make this initiative so great. 